Well, guys, we're doing a series right now on heaven and hell. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine earlier, and he said, man, you sure chose a hard, hard topic. Uh, I didn't choose it. Uh, I feel like the Lord led me to do this, and it is challenging. Today's message is entitled, Defining Heaven. Define it. What is heaven? Just a couple weeks ago, our nation was stunned when this helicopter accident happened with Kobe Bryant and his daughter, and they were killed along with seven others. It caused the corporate thinking to immediately say, where do we go when we die? I was amazed at social media. Because immediately there were all sorts of articles talking about where people believed Kobe went because he was a strong believer. Because we want Kobe to go to heaven. Because uh, we love Kobe. But you can see that this is not just on the minds of believers. This is all over the place. We want to see people go to heaven. And we don't want to see him go to hell. Now, speaking of H-E double hockey sticks, I'd like to say this. The next three weeks, I'm going to talk about hell. I promise not to be uh, fire and brimstone, but I think we need a clear understanding of it. And I'm, I just want to let you know beforehand, I have some questions about hell that I'm going to say out loud. And you may be kicking me out. You may, there may be an insurrection. No, I'm just, I'm just asking questions. And I'm holding my whole theology of hell like this, with open hands. Because I've been, I've been investing in researching heaven and hell for a couple decades now. So I hope you'll come. We've based this series so far on three books. One of them is by Randy Alcorn. It's called Heaven. If you want to get a really big jolt about dying, you should read this book. Because it'll get you excited to die. Because heaven is so cool. All right? So it's a great book on heaven. Very theological and heavy and good stuff. Imagining Heaven by John Burke is, a, is all about interviews, extensive interviews with people who have had near-death experiences. Excellent, excellent book. And he, and he compares those near-death experiences with Scripture. And then also, Destined for the Throne, which is an old favorite of mine by Paul Bilheimer. Man, you want to read a book that will stir you up to follow Jesus, you just read that book. Now, the Bible uses three kinds of heaven when defining heaven. For example, both Old and New talk about the heavens above the earth, which is defining basically just the sky and also the stars. So, so that's the first heaven, is just, I'm looking up into heaven, I'm looking at the sky, I'm looking at the universe. That is the first heaven. Then the Bible talks about something that some of you probably are uncomfortable with, and that is the unseen spiritual realm. The unseen spiritual realm is where both angels and demonic forces interact and stuff goes on. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, our battle is against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. He's referring to the second heaven, which is an unseen realm, a spiritual realm. The third heaven is the place where God lives. The Apostle Paul also tells in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he actually got to visit there one time. And it was beyond words. It was so amazing. So amazing. So awesome. So let's think about heaven for a minute. What's my motivation for wanting to go to heaven? What's my motivation? Hollywood says our motivation is to be with the people we love, 
But it's interesting, when you watch Hollywood movies, for example, the old movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze, it had nothing to do with God. Just, if you're a good person, you just go to be with people that you love. That seems to be the heavy content. So is that kind of your motivation? Like, if I die, I just want to be with people I love. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe my motivation is just to avoid hell. I just don't want to go. Like, some of us, when we became followers of Jesus, the reason we did was we got our life insurance, our fire insurance. So I just wouldn't have to go to hell. But I, I just want to assure you of one thing. That when you become friends with Jesus, your number one motivation is simply to see him face to face and to be near him. That's what truly motivates. It's what excites you about everything. It also affects your motivation for all things. Greg Laurie recently said in an article, here's what I want to say to young people. I'm talking to you about a relationship with Jesus Christ, a friendship with God, that you can know him in a personal way and he'll give you the purpose in life you've been searching for. Because everyone at some point in their life gets around to these three questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what's going to happen to me when I die? All three of these questions are answered in a relationship with Jesus. So I wonder, does, does the love of Jesus, just being in love with Jesus, does that compel you to the point where you just are excited about dying for him? Living your life for him? Being with him in heaven? Let me ask you about this one. Do you think very often about bringing others with you? Are you motivated by that? Do you want to bring others with you? You know, the big question we had a couple weeks ago was, how many trophies did Kobe Bryant bring with him to heaven? How many really cool basketball star suits did he bring with him? How many really cool sports cars did he bring with him to heaven? You see, the only thing Kobe or you or I can bring to heaven is other people. They're the only ones we can bring. They're, they're the only thing we can bring. And how motivated are you to see them go with you? Not because you want to keep them from H-E double hockey sticks, but because you want to have a friendship with them for eternity. Have you thought about that? So far in our series, we've established this. When people go to heaven, followers of Jesus see people they love. I want you to be encouraged about that. People who have gone before you, you see them, you recognize them. Man, that's good. That's really good. I know that some of you young people, like when I interview young people, you know what the big thing they say to me is? Please, Jesus, don't come back before I get to be married. It's that important to us. And the second question is, is really, when I go to heaven, I won't be married to my wife or my husband? What is that? That just doesn't sound like heaven. Friend, just understand, I don't know how to explain it, but it's going to be better than earth. It's going to be better. And you'll still be intimate with the people you've been intimate, and you're going to meet people from every kind of ethnicity on the planet, which will be very cool. I mean, let's just face it. The ethnic Baskin Robbins in this town is mostly vanilla. <laughs> and man, we need some more flavors around here. I'm just saying. And when you get to heaven, man, it's going to be just awesome. People from every kind of ethnicity. 
And they're all going to be worshiping Jesus together. It's going to be awesome. Another thing we've established is that followers of Jesus see God. They see Jesus. They see God the Father. Apostle John says, we don't know what we're going to be like when we get up there, but we know we'll be just like him because we'll see him as he is. Wow. We've established this, that heaven's atmosphere is saturated with love, with belonging, with acceptance, and the sense of home. How does that, how does it get better than that? Now let's add this. Followers of Jesus see people from all ethnic groups. Man, that's going to be cool. We're going to learn from one another. It's going to be beautiful. Second, there is worship. Now, some of us don't like worship. In fact, some of us prefer to come late to church because we want to avoid the singing. You know, a good friend of mine was recently saying to me, where else in our culture do people sing together like they do in church? And frankly, the only place they do it is when they light their phone at a concert and they sing along but no one can hear them because the because the PA is so loud if you watch old black and white movies our culture used to be about singing together you see World War II World War I movies even Civil War movies and men sang together that's a new one for our culture today Men sang together in the bars. They sang together. Women sang. People got together in homes and they would sing. Now, because our culture has become so focused on stardom that you do not sing unless you've got a star's level voice. So people prefer not to sing. But I want you to understand something. We are going to continue to do worship in our church. Why? Because it's a picture of heaven. You know, when I go overseas to see people that we support in missions, like when I go to Kazakhstan, my friends in Kazakhstan don't understand. One, one time I went with them and they immediately took me to a Starbucks. They said, we just opened up a Starbucks. We thought you'd like an American coffee. I said, you guys. I love Starbucks, thank you. But what I really want is Bish Parmak, which is their national di dinner. I want some plof, which is another national dinner. I want some, some shashlik. Man, that's good stuff. I want to eat ethnic Kazakh food. Because it's good and nobody can make it in America like they do. You see, when people come into our church, we want them to taste a piece of the culture of heaven. We want to find belonging, acceptance, love, home, and worship. But it's not all singing worship. Whatever people are doing is done to the glory of Jesus. In heaven, that's what they do. If you ever come to our church during the week, you'll meet Robert Luna, our maintenance guy. I give him a hard time because I know where he is. If I'm walking down the hall, I just listen for Robert. He's either whistling or worshiping, singing. And I get on him. I just say, hey, this is not a happy place. No singing, no whistling. And he laughs. And then he goes right back to it. <laughs> but you know what ha what's happened to Robert? He's filled with the Holy Spirit. If you don't like worship, get a dose of the ghost. You need to be refilled or maybe filled for the first time. Because when the Holy Spirit immerses you in himself, all you want to do is do what they do in heaven. Are, are you hearing me? It's the reality. Finally, one thing we have to describe about heaven is that it's indescribable. Even though we try to describe it, 
people who have had near-death experiences, they always say, I took forever to tell anybody about it because I didn't even know how to describe it. My friend Don Daniel told me about a friend of his, and he's, this friend of his had a near-death experience. And Don said, most people talk about what they see. This guy said he could not stop, stop talking about the music. And it was so absolutely, indescribably beautiful that ever since he came back to life, he's tried to copy, somehow create that kind of music, and he can't even get close to it. It just frustrates him. Does that sound cool? I mean, it's going to be awesome, guys. Let's all just die. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So what's interesting, guys, is that the Bible shows us two heavens, the kind of heaven, which is the third heaven where God lives. And those two heavens are the present heaven, which some people would say the intermediate heaven, the temporary heaven. Did you know that it's kind of a, a tent right now. It's just a temporary place. And then there's a new heaven, which is, think about this. The new heaven is going to be set up on earth. And I'll get to that before the end of today. Now, if you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to open it to Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. You may want to keep, it, keep your finger in there, or if you have it on a device, just keep it open there, because we're going to make several observations about this passage, because this passage is probably one of the best pictures of the present heaven. This is before Jesus sets up the new earth, and this is what goes on in the present heaven. It says, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the, sol the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And, he cr and they cried out with a loud voice. They cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They're looking for justice. And there was given to each of them a white robe. Did you catch? Each one of them received a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Isn't that a weird statement? So it's like Jesus is getting ready to come back, but there's a certain number of people who have to be martyred before he comes back. Now Randy Alcorn in his book Heaven makes these observations about Revelation chapter 6. First of all, very obvious, when people died on earth, they relocated to heaven. So, this is the biblical picture. When you die on earth, we have such great hope because if you're a follower of Jesus, you change addresses. You don't just cease to exist. These people in heaven were the same ones killed for Christ while on the earth. This demonstrates a very strong continuity between what happens on earth and how it goes on in heaven. They are known in heaven for what they did on earth. Did you catch that? So what you did on earth is not forgotten once you get to heaven. It's actually still a part of who you are. People in heaven will be remembered for their lives on earth. It says these were known and identified as ones slain because of the testimony they maintained. Pretty interesting. They're remembered for their lives on earth. What you do on earth echoes through eternity. So it says in a famous movie. Anybody got it? Joe? The gladiator. He wasn't even a believer, was he? Not Joe, but the gladiator. Good job, Joe. 
catch this. Did you see this in verse 10? They called out. They're able to express themselves. Now this could suggest actual physical bodies with vocal cords. And other tangible means to express themselves. So basically, people in the present heaven can raise their voices. But what's cool, this indicates that they're rational, communicative, and emotional. They're even passionate, just like they are on earth. Did you catch that? It's not like you get assimilated into the Borg and you're just all a bunch of lifeless kind of people. You still have passion. Okay, some of you don't have passion. Maybe you'll have passion up there. It says they cried out in a loud voice. Did you catch that? Not loud voices. I think that's fascinating. Individuals speaking with one voice indicate that heaven is a place of unity and shared perspective. Lord, how long are you going to put up with these people who keep killing the people that love you? And they're all saying it. The monitors are fully conscious, rational, and aware of each other, of God, and the situation on earth. Did you catch that? They're fully aware of what's happening down there on the planet. Hebrews chapter 11 says that we have this cloud of witnesses surrounding us. And it's a picture of those who have walked in faith before us. Go! Go! We're praying for you, man. You can do this. They ask God to intervene on earth and to act on their behalf. How long until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Man, that's cool. Now catch this one. Those in heaven are free to ask God questions. Which means that they have an audience with God. Man, that's cool, isn't it? Did you hear that? That was like John Denver. Far out. I didn't know that word was back. Good job. That is far out, man. What that says is they're free to learn. Did you catch that? I mean, like, maybe you don't just get to heaven and you go, Oh, I can do pi out to the 27th digit. No, maybe you can't. Maybe you don't know everything all of a sudden. Maybe maybe you still are in this learning process when you get to heaven. They're seeking understanding and they desire to get it by talking to God himself. I still remember uh, last year I went to a uh, I went to a pastor's conference down in Texas. My my daughter goes to this mega church that has twenty thousand people in it, and and Gay and I had been down there before and heard this guy speak, and and um, so I'm down there at this pastor's conference and I go I, I'm a pastor I, I'm going to go meet this guy, and it's just stupid how how celebrity just gets all over you. I'm I'm, I'm walking up to him just getting nervous. Uh, what am I going to say? What if I say something stupid? Hey, my name's Randy. I'm, and, and, and I just got tongue-tied. You're doing it. Thank you. Can you imagine the God of the universe will be approachable in heaven? What's interesting in John Burke's book, Imagining Heaven, he talks about one of the first people you see is Jesus. And he's there to greet you himself. The man. This is heard by way over 60% of people who have near-death experience. Whoa. I, I don't know what I'll say to him. I think I'll just be on the, on the ground sucking grass. Just, you know, I'm, wow. Not sucking marijuana grass. 
Did you? Just want to be clear about that. I, I saw questions on people's mind. You're going to be token up there? What? But did you catch in verse 10? People in the present heaven know what's happening on earth. The martyrs know enough to realize that those who killed them have not yet been judged. They're watching. Lord, when are you gonna when are you gonna do justice? Wow. Have heaven dwellers have a deep concern for justice and retribution. When we go to heaven, we're not gonna have just this passive disinterest in what happens on earth. Who cares? I'm up here, I've got it made. No, what's going to continue to happen is we're praying for those people we love down on earth. We're praying for people we don't know down on earth. We're praying for all sorts of stuff because it's still important to us. The martyrs clearly remember their lives on earth. They even remember that they were murdered. They remember all this stuff. It's not like you just switch, turn a switch and you don't remember anything that happened before. The martyrs in heaven pray for judgment on their persecutors who are still at work hurting others. They're actively in solidarity with those who are being persecuted for the sake of the gospel. And folks, we don't know about it because we're not actively persecuted for the sake of the gospel here. Not anything like they are overseas in Muslim cultures, Hindu cultures, Buddhist cultures even. Those in heaven see God's attributes. And they define them. They say, you're holy and true. In a way that makes his judgment of sin even more understandable. I think that when they see him for who he is, they they see that this is, this is really good. He is so good and he's so just. I know he's going to do the right thing here. I don't know if you caught this, but in verse 11, those in heaven are distinct individuals. Each of them is given a white robe. There's not a merged identity. They are each given a white robe, the robe of righteousness, which you've been given but you can't see right now. That robe of righteousness means that when I come before Jesus, he accepts me as, my, as his kid and loves me. Not because of anything I did, not because of anything I deserve, but because of what Jesus did on the cross on my behalf. The martyrs wearing white robes suggest the possibility of actual physical forms because disembodied spirits presumably don't wear robes. Because, you know, you've seen the movies where disembodied spirits, you put a robe on them and it just fall to the floor. So this could be, it could be just a metaphor, but it, it could also mean that they really do exist in a physical form. We're not sure. God answers their questions, indicating communication and process in heaven. God promises to fulfill the martyr's requests. But it's interesting. He says you're going to have to wait a little longer. Now, interesting, waiting a little longer means that there's probably right now in heaven a time kind of thing operating. He's saying, guys, it's not time yet, so I'm asking you to rest. I don't know if you caught that. He said, you guys take a rest and wait a little longer, which implies right now there's time. There's time in the present heaven, and the white robe martyrs ask God a time-dependent question. How long, O sovereign Lord, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? They're aware the time is passing, and how long will he wait? The people of God in heaven have a strong familial connection with those on earth who are called their fellow servants and brothers. You, isn't that kind of neat? People who have gone before you, 
they're still connected to you. And they're praying for you. You know, the Bible says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and prays for us. And if we're there with Jesus, I imagine that we just join in on the prayer time and pray for those on earth. Finally, our God knows down to the last detail all that is happening and will happen on earth, including every drop of blood shed and every bit of suffering undergone by his children. So God's watching every single detail and apparently the people with him see it as well. Now, at some point, Jesus is going to return. We've had people come to our church and say, Randy, are you pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, pre-millennial, post-millennial? And most of you are saying, Randy, quit with the seminary words. What does all that mean even? I just want to let you know that David, our preaching pastor, and I are pan-millennialists, which means that we believe it will all pan out in the end. <laughs> we are clueless. We real, I mean, we have ideas, but they're just ideas. We're just not sure when Jesus will come back because really only the Father knows that and wh how he's going to do it. So why, why worry ourselves about it and why get upset about it? Okay? So I just want to let you know, Jesus will return someday, and man, it's going to be cool. It'll be amazing when Jesus comes back. But when Jesus comes back, and then we have the, the white throne judgment, where all of us will be judged before God. I find it fascinating. There seems to be a little bit of a a pre-trial that happens with people. When you read John Burke's book about imagining heaven, he says that, says that it, it's a large percentage of people who encounter heaven in the twinkling of an eye go back over their lives and there's this, they're looking back at their lives and they're, and they're seeing thoughts, they're thing, seeing things that they did and, and it's all being reflected back to them. And what's cool about it is there is no condemnation whatsoever. None. But there's grief in people going, oh man, oh man, I, if I'd have seen what I see here, I would have done things different. But there'll be this great white throne judgment, but then the Bible teaches, both in the Old Testament, Isaiah is full of it, all the way through the New Testament, especially in Revelation 21 and 22. If you want to see what the new earth looks like, read Revelation 21 and 22. And there's going to be a new earth. Now, it's interesting. People, people get kind of uptight when they read some of this because like it says, there won't be any seas. And so people who love the beach and who are sea captains are ticked off. What? But basically, that's probably a metaphor for meaning there'll be no divisions between peoples of nations. Okay? What I'm guessing is that a lot of what we see today will be on the new earth. Trees and rivers and animals. Jesus comes down on a white horse, people. There's animals up there. So you know. Some of you, that's the only thing you're going to remember today. <laughs> oh, good, there's animals. Okay, good. But let, let, let's just imagine, man, when the new earth is going to be absolutely amazing. And the Bible teaches that, we're, that our bodies are going to be resurrected because there's this, there's this connection in human beings between their spirit and and their body. It's not like what the Greeks teach, that you're just this spirit that's put into an earth suit, and then when you die, your spirit goes away, and this thing is no more important. The Hebrews believed that the earth suit is important, and it's going to be reformed and redone, and all of the older people are thrilled right now. Are, am I, is that right? 
It's going to be redone. Man, that is good news. Paul Marshall says our destiny is an earthly one. A new earth, an earth redeemed and transfigured. An earth reunited with heaven, but an earth nevertheless. I don't know if you know that God is into the prefix re, R-E. Because he doesn't just set us free and put us in a new heaven. He wants to renew this earth. Renovate this earth. Redeem the children of men and women. Regenerate. Recreate. Got any more? What was that? Renew. Restore. Resurrect. Okay, resurrect. Are you catching? God likes re. He's going to set up a new planet and everything that's been ruined by, the, the, by sin's curse will be re-something. Isn't that good? So maybe you're here today and you've never had a friendship with Jesus. Maybe you've been religious. Maybe you've been to church. But you've never had a friendship with Jesus. I want to invite you to do it today. I'm, I'm asking you with your eyes open. Anybody just want to raise your hand and say, yeah, that, that's probably me. I, don't be afraid because you're going to have to let people know. Anybody? You see one? Oh, I, I, there it is. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, oh, thank you. Wow. Guys, thanks for raising your hands. That was courageous. Way to go, you brave people. Will you join me in praying for these guys? Will you, folks, if you raise your hand, and even if you didn't, if you're too afraid, uh, there's no condemnation. Not with this God. Okay? So why don't you just pray this sincerely? Dear God, I want to be friends with you. Now I know that I've done some stuff that stands between us. And so what I want to ask you is if you'd forgive me for the things I've done. And I, I also just want to take a moment to forgive people who have hurt me. I, I, I'm not expecting to, uh, to go out and befriend them tomorrow. I just want to release them from the grudge and the resentment that I've had against them. And I want to just invite you to just come into my heart. In fact, I, I just ask for your Holy Spirit to baptize me and just to fill me from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. And I want to have a friendship with you. I'd, I'd like to be able to hear your voice. I'd like to be led by you in your scriptures. And, and I just want the Bible to be a new book for me where it's not just this dead historical book, but it's, it's a love letter from my dad. And I just want to ask you to transform my life. Thank you, God. I receive new life by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, good job, guys. Okay, now you're, my challenge is that you tell somebody, okay? Tell somebody about this this week, okay? Okay, um, heaven's an exciting place. Next three weeks, we're going to talk about the traditional view of hell, what is called the annihilationist view of hell, and the universalist view of hell in the next three weeks. I hope you'll come. I, I want you to work through what you believe about hell. That's why I want to talk about it with you. Um, so many of your friends that don't know Jesus, according to Scripture, are headed there apart from him. So it's important that we understand what it is.